Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Another View producer Lisa Godley, filling in for Barbara Ham Lee. About 70% of African-American children cannot swim. As a result, black children drown at an alarming rate. And if you've ever thought that because your skin is darker that you don't have to worry about skin cancer, think again. Plus, a conversation with the creator of the new documentary, The Trouble with TQ. It's another view on summer health, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for choosing to spend part of your afternoon listening to Another View. I'm Lisa Godley, the show's producer, filling in for Barbara Ham Lee, who's under the weather but assures me she'll be back next week. In the meantime, I'm going to do my best to make her proud as we discuss African Americans and summer health. Let's start the discussion with some information that completely blew me away, and that's that about 70% of African American children do not know how to swim. Now, some of the studies say 60% while other research goes as high as 80%. And if they're hanging out with their friends and they find themselves at the pool, the lake, or the beach, what they don't know could kill them. Now joining me here in the studio is another view on health co-host, cardiologist, Dr. Keith Newby. Keith, welcome. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine. Also with us is Daniel Jones, the division head for the City of Norfolk Aquatics. Dan, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay. Now as a reporter here in Hampton Roads for so many years, some of the most heart-wrenching stories I ever had to cover involved children drowning. Some were at the pool, others at the lake, some at the beach, and in the majority of cases, the child was African-American. Now, I know for a lot of people, there's a fear. And Keith, I'm going to start with you and ask you if you know how to swim and when did you start and was there a fear factor for you? Uh, well, I started swimming when I was probably seven or eight years old. Um, and I, you know, of course, there's a fear factor um, when you're doing something that you're not used to doing. Uh, but, you know, I was I loved the water. So for me, it wasn't as difficult once I got past that fear factor. I was good after that. And we did have some friends we knew that you know, they had a pool. So I would go there periodically. So I was able to, of course, stay in that shallow end for a good while until I felt that comfort level going to the deep end. But once I was I felt comfortable with that. And, you know, my mom was on me about making sure that uh, we were safe. You know, my brother and sister and I before we got to extend our uh, horizons to go into the ocean and that kind of thing. Uh, but that was eight years old for me. Okay. Now, see, Dan, growing up for myself, my dad would put me on his back, go out in the ocean, swim. I would be terrified mm-hmm. the whole time. Uh, as a teenager, I took swim lessons with the neighbor. He taught me a little bit about swimming. As an adult, I took swim lessons at uh, the YMCA. Can go back and forth to do the American Crawl. Still have no desire to be in water over my head. How do we get over that kind of fear? A lot of folks really... Uh, don't like to be in deep water, even though they can swim and they can swim back and forth. A lot of folks think they're swimming when they're really just waiting. So that's important to remember too. But it really comes down to practice and having somebody that you trust in the water with you and, um, and just spending time doing that would be my recommendation. Spending time. Yeah. Just time in the time in the water. And then again, having somebody, a, a, either it's an instructor or a friend or, or somebody who, who's competent in the water with you. And then that, um, you would, you would acclimate at that point. He brings up a very good point in that, um, you know, one of the things I I found people get in trouble is they take chances that they probably shouldn't take, either for through, you know, when they're with peer pressure, you know, going out and they think they can go out. And, I, and even, you know, myself, I had an issue when I was, I think I was 16 years old. And there was a place out in Virginia Beach, I can't remember where it is now, it was a kind of a private kind of beach thing. I was a tutor, and uh, we went to a, uh, uh, this took the kids out there for that, and there was a, a sandbar that was, it didn't look like it was that far, but it was probably every bit of a couple hundred yards uh, from the beach, but it didn't look that far when I went to start swimming out there. 
So, of course, you know, I'm starting to like, oh, I can do this, you know, so I'm going out there because everybody says we're going to challenge each other to go to the sandbar. And I almost got in trouble trying to get out there to that. Because once you start swimming, swimming takes a lot of work. If you really start to, you know, see it because you're using muscles you don't normally use, and you can get in trouble if you're not careful. And then ran to a school of jellyfish, which didn't help. So, uh, you know, that was just stinging all over the place and trying to swim out there. And I literally, I got caught with a rip current. And it was starting to take me off. I know, I know. I hope my mom's not listening because she would have a fit right now. If she knew about this because, of course, I kept that piece to myself. But I was able to make it to that sandbar. But I knew when I had to get back, it was. I was like, I was beeline. I would say, I'm going to make it. I, I had my target in sight. And I said, I'm going to just head to that because uh, I had to get back. Right. But that was. I found people can get in trouble by you know challenging each other and. And, it's, and you're in situations where your comfort level is not great and you go and do it anyway. And when you're young, you may make those errors. Right. I, I know, Dan, when I when my daughters tell me they're going to the beach with, you know, another family or something, I say, don't go in water over, you know, higher than your waist. Because I've done stories on the, on the undertow and, and how different elements. What do you recommend that people learn how to swim? Because I know some people start, they're out in the ocean. Some people learn man-made lakes. What is, what is your recommendation? Probably most folks are going to be more comfortable in a swimming pool uh, where there's lifeguards on duty and, and trained instructors uh, providing the instruction. And um, look at the YMCA, American Red Cross type programs. Uh, and then you're starting off in shallow water, move your way into the deeper water. And you're going to be more comfortable probably in a swimming pool environment to start off with because you don't have the factors you, you understand and you can see your bottom conditions. You don't have jellyfish to deal with and, and other you know, marine life, which can make somebody apprehensive and wanting to even get into open water to begin with. So that's my recommendation is probably start in the pool. If you don't have that, you certainly can learn to swim. A lot of us prob- learn to swim in, in um, open water, um, whether it be you know, a lake. Calmer water would be better than ocean with um, any type of currents or surf. Okay. Is there an age that you recommend people bring their children in to, to teach them to start? Because I've seen babies. I sure. mean, I'm, I'm just curious. Red, Red Cross has classes that start um, as early as six months. Basically, it's a, a parent and child class and, and you know, one years old, uh, um, two years old. Those are all good times to start. And basically, the um, child and parent are both learning techniques to learn to swim. Um, our motions uh, and they're developing a, a comfort level in the water at that point so that they they can move on to, to learn strokes um, easily after that but every child learns to swim at a different pace and that's what we have to remember so whoever the child is um, they, they they'll, they'll see if their parents are afraid or, or their siblings are afraid of the water and that can sometimes interfere with their learning um, so, so trying to get them in the water with somebody who's comfortable, even if it's not a parent, it's another uh, uh, relative or um, whoever it might be that they can trust to, to, to accompany them in the water. But you know, we encourage the parents to also participate because they have to be com- they they have to be competent um, in the water and they have to at least uh, understand the dangers. And that's the biggest problem with the drowning is for for children is most definitely a lack of uh, adult supervision. Yeah, I noticed at least once a summer. We get the when I was in the newsroom, we would get the call that there was a child missing sure. at the ocean front, and you would, you know, we get there and people would be just scattered and looking, and it would just be almost total chaos. We get we, you know, our our lifeguards in um, an Ocean View beaches. We uh, it's in, once a week what we're having to look for a missing child where a parent hadn't seen their their three or four year old in a long period of time. It sometimes it's been as many as three hours, and they come to us and they they, they haven't seen their child, and that for three hours and, and um, a non-swimming three or four year old in the um, around the open water so you know it really comes uh, down to being you know some parents are negligent uh, in, in these cases and I don't think that in, in general the public um, understands the hazards of water you know you, uh, children are often left in vehicles um, with the windows up or down whichever it might be and um, the child's gonna last a lot longer in that vehicle than they would in, in a water environment if left alone Wow. And um, and and so we really and, and, and we we emphasize not leaving children in, in in vehicles. Of course, we shouldn't. But it's much more dangerous to leave a a non-swimming child in an open water environment because they're not going to last even a minute before they're um, a drowning case. Wow, I remember a story a couple of years back. Some some teenagers had come down from, um, I think it was New Jersey or New York, and they were out at the ocean front, and they had kind of challenged each other as you were speaking earlier. And they were walking. They decided they were going to walk up to the water, was up to their necks, 
And as before they could get even to the neck, there was a drop off and two of them disappeared. And, you know, of course, everybody started beginning the search for them. But um, they were gone. I I think it was um, two or three days before they actually uh, found them. And um, they did. They couldn't swim. And then they got caught in the undertow, too. So even if they were decent swimmers, it was it was going to be kind of rough. That's what I tell that. people all the time, that you never know what that current underneath the water is going to be like. Um, and I'm very particular about that and uh, very cognizant of that anytime I'm walking out there because you just never know. And that current gets you. I mean, even some really strong swimmers can get caught, you know, with that. And uh, and if you're and you, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to panic, especially if you're not a trained swimmer. Um, you will panic, and that panic mode would gets people in trouble too. So that, I think you respect the water, um, and uh, that will always get you safe. I mean, as I was mentioned earlier, when my daughter's in that water, I am watching her like a hawk, and I will not let her go. But so far out, and without me being in front of her, or, you know, in front of her, like in the deeper end, to she has to come through me to get past me. Right. I mean, and that's just and that's just my paranoia as a parent. I just don't like to take those kind of risks. Dan, I know because when lifeguards have to jump in to save somebody who who may be drowning, I know a lot of times they have to to pretty much fight with that person because they're that person feels like they're fighting for their lives. What is the what is the process? What are they taught and trained? You know, most most victims don't struggle against us. You know, they're 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 going to grab whatever we hand to them, which is typically a flotation device. On the beaches, we use rescue cans, uh, which are a plastic buoy, and then on um, swimming pools, we use a tube. Um, in most every case, unless it's a combative swimmer who's intoxicated or um, under the influence, we usually don't have any problems bringing someone in. Oh, that's good but to know. We train, we train the lifeguards <laughs> to handle them if, if necessary. Um, but uh, you know, put a rescue tube in somebody's uh, uh, right in front of somebody or put it in their chest. They're going to grab it and we're going to tow them in. Um, it, as far as a parent, something to consider in knowing the bottom conditions of a, um, of a beach is very important. Wait out there before your children go out so you understand where that drop off is. There are troughs between sandbars that we have to be aware of. And then in swimming pools, know those water depths. They're going to be marked so you know where that child can go. And most of the time around five feet, there's going to be a safety line. So understanding those conditions. And again, swimming near a lifeguard is because they're going to know what those conditions are and whether there's jellyfish in the water or any rips in that particular day and that um and understand that there are flags on the beaches too to designate um whether the the surf conditions are are, are rough or not okay um do they are, are there problems with people often because I, I hear things from time to time but is that a big problem people still trying to go out into the into the ocean and when when the current is not conducive to being out there absolutely what sometimes what we'll see is they'll go into unguarded areas so that they can swim and swim during electrical storms you know that uh, and we so we clear our beaches and pools during electrical storms for obvious reasons and then people will then go to other unguarded areas so that they can swim during electrical storm and they take their children and that's just irresponsible wow when you think about when they have a hurricane there's always somebody that's in the beach in the ocean waving at a camera Hi, Mom. <laughs> Looking at that, like, are you kidding me? I mean, during a hurricane. So, I mean, I don't put anything past anybody. So I applaud you guys 100% because that's got to be a tough job at times to really, you know, and you're trying to make sure people stay safe and, and some people just combative. Sure. sure. Some yeah, some people are resistant to any type of authority and they and then and they figure this will never happen to me. I can swim in these conditions and and um, and that's where we come in. Dan, do you find the numbers that we were talking about um, at the beginning of the show alarming that that many African-American children cannot swim? It is alarming. Um, and there's programs that we have in Norfolk uh, for all Norfolk citizens, but we have a, we have a lot of kids that come through our, our, our Learn to Swim programs, or American Red Cross classes. But we also have like summer plunge program where we uh, kids from the rec centers come to our swimming pools and we teach them um, basic water safety and, and introduction to swimming. And these are free programs and we have a second grade um uh, school splash program with the, um, with the Norfolk public schools as well. And, um, so we're, we're, we're targeting the groups and, and it's, we're finding success. Um, but it is, uh, it, it is something we all have to be aware of and, and just realize African Americans are more than likely. We're probably, if I'm going to make a water rescue, it's, uh, it's at least two to one that's going to be an African American child and children in general are at risk. Um, nationwide, uh, Children, um, preschoolers are more likely to die from a drowning death than anything but motor ve- or a motor vehicle accident. 
um, as far as uh, an accidental death. So that's an alarming rate. In some in some states with um, with more water, like California, Arizona, Florida, it's actually the, the leading cause of accidental death for um, for small children. And then it jumps back up for males, uh, um, early teens, um, well, actually teens all the way through the uh, um, 20, 24 years old. Um, and then you can double that. It would be uh, uh, for African-American um, males at that age. Take me through how you would take somebody who's really terrified of the water but wants to learn to swim. What is the first thing you do to try to get that person at ease? <laughs> um, well, first, you know, make, making sure that they're comfortable in, in shallow water so that their feet are on um, on, on a solid uh, bottom of the pool, yeah, pool bottom. And I think that's important. And then whenever we're doing anything with them, we, they can hold on to the side of the side of the pool as well, whether it be a gutter, whether it be the deck or coping stone. And, and then they feel more comfortable uh, because they're stable. And then and working on face in the water is an, is an important step. And, you know, we teach children to bob and we teach children, but we do the same with adults. We all have to learn to put our faces in the water if we're not comfortable. And that's, that's, that's part of it. And you can do those skills even in the shower or the bathtub uh, at home and, and practice just getting your face wet. And, um, and then there's the, the floating factor, getting folks to be um, comfortable enough to be able to float and relax. Because if we're tense, we're not going to float as well. And, um, I know that from personal yeah, exactly. experience. <laughs> and, and, they can, and, they, and those those skills can be practiced in a swimming pool and shallow end too. You know, um, and holding on to the to the, to the side and, and then letting go and and, and, and practicing. And then um, your your particular body position is important too. You know, whether your 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 legs are straight out, you bend your knees a certain amount, and, and every body floats differently. And we have a, um, a center of buoyancy, um, and each of us are different. I mean, I've got long legs, so it's a little different for me to try to float. Uh, so those are a couple of things, but, but getting with someone that you're comfortable with and, and having swimming instruction is important, but I think if you do take swimming lessons, practice between the lessons and then after the lessons. And for children, if you know, parents put, put their children through a, a class, realize that that's just the beginning. They have to continue to get better and practice the skills, and if the mo- mom or dad are in there with them, that's even better. Wonderful. Phew. That's a lot to take in, but I, um, I certainly appreciate that. Um, we were talking a little bit before we came in, the, the interns and I, and we were talking about um, treading water mm-hmm. and how difficult we thought that was. But they always, people always tell you, well, you know, if you get in deep water, tread water. So why is it we, <laughs> we're thinking that's something very hard to, to do, but that's what everyone's always told to, it, to do. It is. It's a life-saving skill. And, um, you know, you really, if you, if, if you fell off a boat in the middle of the, um, a large body of water, if you can tread, you can, you can stay alive. Um, we, there's survival floating and other skills that we learn, but, but treading is important. And you practice that just like, you know, you, you can practice in, in shallow water, but I would practice first with a, some sort of a flotation device. And then you're learning your kicks and you're learning to keep yourself afloat. And then, and again, being with somebody, you know, always practice with, with someone and make sure you're, you're, you're training in a, in a lifeguarded facility. Um, but treading, uh, there's, there's different kicks. You're using um, a, you can use a flutter kick, but uh, a rotary kick is what's most important. It's kind of like when you're riding a bike, but you're pulling your knees in every time that you're pulling your, um, you're, you're moving your legs, you're pulling your knees in, kind of like riding a bike. And you try to relate that because most people can ride a bike. Um, so, uh, Treading, uh, to me, is, is as valuable a skill as any lifeguard can ever ever know. Um, you, if you can you can master treading, you can master water rescue in general, and you can um, keep yourself afloat and someone else. And you have to be able to do that. You have to practice that in deep water. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Keith, can you tread water? Oh yeah, actually, uh, I was uh, I was just mentioned earlier. I was in Florida a couple a week ago on a little vacation I took, and I, I one thing I didn't I never noticed until I went out in this ocean water was the salt water is different when you're floating mm-hmm. versus pool water because I was I was getting into that salt water. I mean, because I can float really good on mm-hmm. that. And it was just as peaceful and as relaxing as I've ever experienced. So I, I was treading everything. I was having a good old time. Uh, so that's, um, but I, I didn't really pay attention to the difference between salt and pool water, till I, you know, did that and just, you know, just you know, be able to see there is a difference. Sure. But you know, floating in ocean water is a lot easier to me. Uh, I don't know if you experienced oh, that as it well. It is okay. yeah, more buoyant salt yeah. water, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you guys for this part. We're going to get ready to transition a little bit, but um, um, this also kind of ties into to being in the water because we're going to be uh, transitioning into talking a little bit about um, African-Americans and uh, skin cancer. Um, 
what you don't know. We're talking about what you don't know can hurt you. I'm another view producer, Lisa Godley, filling in for Barbara Ham Lee. And joining me is cardiologist and another view on health co host, Dr. Keith Newby and Dan Jones, the division head for the city of Norfolk Aquatics. And uh, joining us on the phone to tackle the issue of um, summer um, health and um, skin cancer among African-Americans. Dr. Kimberly Sauke to address African-Americans and skin cancer. Dr. Sauke, um, are you with us? Yes. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> thanks for having me and, and thanks for including this really important topic. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I want to jump right in and ask you, do black people need sunscreen? Yes, yes, yes. That's an easy question and an easy answer. No matter what your skin tone is, your race or ethnicity, you are absolutely able to develop skin cancer. So sunblock is important for everybody. Okay. Now, I know when we're going to the beach and we're going to be there all day, we really need to, to lather it on. What about um, if you're going to be working out in the yard for an hour or if you're going for a two-mile run. And I would imagine that it's different for someone like Dr. Newby, who has more of a golden tone, or in someone like me, who, as Fashion Fair describes as hazelnut, would need different levels of sunscreen or, or the amount of time that we'd have to apply it. Sure. You know, it's uh, easiest just to have a general guideline for everybody. So, so the answer to whether different skin tones need different uh, sunblock, that's no. Everyone should follow the same guidelines. Um, and yes, it definitely needs to be applied um, even for short outings like what you described. I try to encourage my patients to make it part of a daily habit. So you brush your teeth, you wash your face, you put a little sunblock on, and that way you don't have to worry about, well, am I going to be going for a walk today or will I be at my nephew's baseball game or, you know, when those things come up, uh, you don't have to necessarily think about um, uh, applying it because you've already got it on as a kind of baseline for the day. Okay. And I know there are different levels, the 30, the 50, the 70. Mm -hmm. Are there, is one specifically better for different types or, or the stronger, the better? What do you recommend? Yeah, well, um, there are definitely a lot of kind of confusing uh, labels out there. When you look at the sunblocks, there's entire shelves and shelves of different ones to choose from. But there are a few general guidelines that everyone should go by. Um, when you're picking a sunblock, uh, you should definitely choose one that's broad spectrum. So that means it blocks UVA and UVB uh, rays from the sun. So those are two different types of, of sun wavelengths that can do different things to the skin. Um, you should choose one that's water resistant and one that's got an SPF or sun protection factor of 30 or greater. So sometimes uh, the uh, ones with higher SPFs are more expensive and that's not, it's not worth the extra investment as long as it's got a 30 or greater, uh, then you're in good shape. Now, sometimes people fall short even after they pick the best sunblock, um, they fall short in terms of um, how to use it. So uh, most patients, most people apply only about 25 to 50 percent of the amount of sunblock that they ought to use. So you really should have a generous amount to cover all of your sun-exposed skin, so arms, legs, places like the tops of the ears people forget sometimes. Um, and in general, we say that the amount it takes to fill a shot glass, which is about one ounce, is the amount that's required to cover an average adult. So it's not only about choosing the right um, sunblock, you also have to apply the right amount of it. Dr. Saki, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, and when you look at the duration of time you're out mm -hmm. versus the uh, the SPF uh, number, does that have any bearing? Like, say, if you're somebody that's going to be out for an hour versus out for five hours, does it really matter um, in terms of that number? Is it more just the number of applications that you need to put on? Yeah. Uh, so the the frequency with which the sunblock should be applied um, is every two hours, period. It doesn't matter what the SPF is. Okay. Um, by strictest definition, the SPF has to do with how long um, the duration of time it takes to get a sunburn can be extended. Um, but it, whether you're using an SPF 30 or 45 or 75, it doesn't matter. In order to achieve that degree of sun protection, it still has to be reapplied every two hours. 
Is that also include if you are in the water? Is that like if you get yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Those, okay, so it's the so, same duration regardless. That's true. Okay. And in fact, if you've been in the water or if you've been really sweaty, then um, you should reapply it more often. So once okay. you come out of the water and once you dry off, even being near the water increases uh, your sun exposure in the sense that water and also sand, like at the beach um, and snow, um, reflect the sun's rays. So you may be getting even more sun than you realize by being, say, out by the water or at the beach. And Dan, you were saying you are you. The life guys are constantly reminding each other. Uh, to... Absolutely, they have each other's back by rubbing each other. You know. Uh, sun protection on their back. But <laughs> 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 like, you can't reach your own back, so we have to help each other out. And Keith, you just returned from Florida, so I'm yeah. sure you were um, yeah, pretty well, much applying it pretty frequently uh, when yeah. you were down there. Well, my wife, she she tends to be uh, uh, very protective of me when I'm there, so she made sure I was. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm very bad at doing things for myself, but she's very good at making sure I do take care of myself. So she uh, she had that stuff out in droves. So uh, she she was very good at that. So she was on me with that that's the way to do it yeah. really needs to go on 15 to 20 minutes before you go out and then be reapplied every two hours um, you can get around it a little bit because I know some people feel uh, uneasy about putting anything on their skin or, or just don't feel like making the effort and there's a lot of um, very attractive and stylish sun protective clothing out there too so uh, certainly for kids they call them the rash guards which are the t-shirts with sun uh, protection built in there they make those for adults too and there's even products that you can wash into your regular clothes that will impart um, some sun protection so if you're not into um, putting on a lot of sunblock uh, you can certainly wear sun protective clothing, and if you do both, well, then you'll be in even better shape. Wow, that's great to know. Yeah, getting back, uh, you know, you brought up a, a point I just wanted to ask real quick as well. If you, there's some people, you know, different, may wear different types of shirts, and uh, so, and I'm assuming there's some that are thinner than others, and of course, uh, that may ha uh, dictate some exposure. You mentioned earlier about uh, putting this, the uh, um, lotion on sun-exposed skin, but if you have a thinner shirt, would that matter that it needs to be underneath that shirt as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, we think of a white T-shirt as imparting a sun protection factor <clears throat> of about four. And I just told you that SPF 30 or greater is what you need. So just because you've got your, your T-shirt on, that doesn't mean that that skin's protected. And, and so you should apply it even underneath clothing like that. Okay. All righty. We're talking about um, African-Americans and summer health. If you'd like to join the conversation, give us a call at 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Dr. Salki, um, what's the most common kind of skin cancer for African-Americans? Um, well, there are three types of skin cancer that are most common in all uh, individuals. That's one called basal cell um, that's the most common in Caucasians, tends to be second most common in African Americans. Uh, squamous cell is the next most common in Caucasian people, and that's the one that we do see most often in African Americans. And then melanoma, which gets a lot of press uh, because it's one of the most deadly forms of skin cancer. Um, and that occurs in African Americans as well. And, and unfortunately, you know, we're all aware of some health disparities uh, uh, related to a lot of different um, medical conditions, and this is one where African Americans tend to be diagnosed with melanoma and any type of skin cancer at a more advanced stage um, than, than other people might, just because that level of suspicion is low. Uh, I come in contact with patients all the time who think that as African Americans, they cannot develop skin cancer, and, and sometimes uh, there are even providers uh, who are not aware that African Americans can develop skin cancer, so if that suspicion is not there, then the diagnosis gets missed, and then um, making the diagnosis at a later stage can lead to a worse prognosis. So um, we need to have that um, index of suspicion, and, and especially for those three most common kinds of skin cancer. I think we were talking before, was it Bob Marley? Mm -hmm. Yes, that, exactly. Um, died of um, skin cancer. Um, is there something that we should notice, say, for example, if we've been out a while, and we is there something we should be looking for? Um, on the skin when we when we get back that that's a, a red flag that yeah we've been exposed too mm -hmm. long um, kind of common sense thing so if your skin is looking red if it's feeling itchy or stingy those uh, ought to get your attention that you need to seek shade 
And then um, just in terms of examining your skin in general, uh, I encourage all of my patients to examine their skin themselves once a month. So um, sometimes we say, look at your uh, birthday suit on your birthday. So if your birthday is the fifth of the month, then on the fifth each month, you should check yourself out from top to bottom. And the main things you're looking for are things that are new or growing or changing. And for African Americans um, in particular, looking at the palms and soles as well as the web spaces, so in between those fingers and toes, because when we get melanoma, that deadly form of skin cancer, um, those are the places where it occurs in African Americans most often. And in fact, Bob Marley had a melanoma on the foot that was initially thought to be a soccer injury um, and, and then was not treated and he died from that. Wow. Now, are there other skin conditions um, that are prominent in African Americans, such as uh, eczema, that put you at higher risk for skin cancer? Uh, yes. Um, eczema is not one of them necessarily. And in fact, we use ultraviolet light and small doses as therapy for things like eczema and psoriasis. But um, there's a, a genetic condition called albinism that you may be familiar with where uh, uh, patients have a, a la- lack or diminished uh, amount of melanin in the skin. And that certainly makes you more uh, at risk for skin cancer. Um, other things like uh, large scars, particularly from burns or from trauma, um, and people who are immunosuppressed, so um, maybe patients being treated for cancer or who have chronic conditions using immune suppressing medications, um, or who have a primary um, illness like HIV, which suppresses the immune system, those folks are also at an increased risk for skin cancer. Wow. Mm. So is there anything particular about the scar? Like say if they had a large scar from something, you know, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, is there any particular just like a change in color or a change in the uh, crustacean or whatever that would make people decide, okay, I need to get that looked at because this is different from what it was. Is there anything in particular they need to look out for? Yeah, any any uh, kind of sore that doesn't heal in a reasonable amount of time should get your attention for sure. In chronic um, injuries to the skin, like a burn scar, um, a squamous cell carcinoma can develop there, especially related to a chronic ulcer. Um, so if it if it breaks open and it just doesn't heal up, then that should definitely get you into the doctor. Wow. Okay. Um, is there anything that makes African American skin less susceptible to to proper healing? Hmm. Less susceptible to proper healing. I, when diabetes it comes, would be one thing. Yeah. When it comes. Know. Yeah. Any other um, illnesses or things that that we tend to, um, as Barbara and I always say, when the rest of the world gets um, um, a cold, we we catch pneumonia. Um, mm. It seems when it comes to different issues. Is well, just, a, yeah. I mean, I could probably jump in on that one. The yeah. things that we see are people who are diabetic, people with vascular disease. You know, like we get our long-term smokers that may develop peripheral vascular disease, and they'll get a cut or something on their foot, and it'll be very difficult for it to heal because it's not getting the adequate blood flow that you know, delivers the white blood cells and things that are the proper healing to get rid of infection and what have you. That's why they're more susceptible to infection because they're not getting the uh, nutrients that normally would fight infection distally. So you'll see that in those kind of um, processes. And Dr. Salker can you know, elaborate if she has other uh, disease processes we see, but that, that those are probably the two big ones I know we see or like things like um, rheumatologic disorders like lupus. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis that may have other where it affects the connective tissue, which subsequently may, um, prom- you know, kind of get a situation where they won't heal as well. Okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. I agree. All righty. Well, we're ab- about to run out of time, and I want to give each one of you an opportunity to um, leave our listeners with, with some advice or some information that you think um, they should know regarding either um, skin cancer or um, swimming. And um, Dr. Salki, I'm going to start with you. Okay. um, Gosh, my take-home message is sunscreen is for everyone, and everyone is at risk for skin cancer, so be sure and uh, check your birthday suit on your birthday and look for anything new or changing or not healing. Okay. Okay. I think the um, just the tap on is something we didn't mention, just heat itself. Uh, When you get into these summer months, I want to caution everybody to make sure you keep yourself well hydrated when you're out in the field like that because it doesn't take much you know to get overheated you talk about heat strokes and that type of thing and that comes a lot from just being outside and this sun is beaming 
and it's 90 some degrees outside and you're outside in that and you're not keeping yourself hydrated it's very easy to get overheated and that can lead to some major major clinical problems so make sure you keep a bottle of water with you and make sure you know that time is coming you need to get out the sun get out take a break and then come back so that would be my take-home message wonderful and dan i'll add to that um when you're on the beaches take an umbrella so you can so you're providing your own shade and pack a cooler full of ice water gatorade whatever works for you something that's, um, that doesn't have caffeine in it but as far as swimming uh swim near a lifeguard learn to swim take some sort of water safety class and uh, always swim with a buddy okay. and buddy system works for all ages wonderful thank you all so much for for your part in in today's show i really appreciate it and when we come back we'll be talking about the trouble with tq with documentary filmmaker calvin thomas right after this I'm Claude McKnight of Group Take Six, and you're listening to Another View, Fridays at noon at WHRV 89.5 FM. Joining me now in the studio is Calvin Thomas, the creator of the documentary film The Trouble with TQ. Calvin, welcome to Another View. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Now, I remember growing up here in Hamilton Roads and hearing stories about the late Reverend Thomas Quinlan and his unusual teaching methods. Um, TQ came to St. Mary's Catholic Church in Norfolk in the mid-70s, and I want to start with a couple of clips from your documentary um, where he's talking about his time here in this area. The dividing line in Norfolk, Virginia is Granby Street. I lived five years on the white side and 11 years on the black side. I had a good perspective about Norfolk, but I could see when I worked with the Confederate widows and all the uppity move-ins who were starting to establish Ghent in the 60s, the people didn't get it. I mean, even the educated people didn't get it. The 11 years in the black parish were a delight. You could adapt anything because the people were adaptable. 85% of them were converts from Protestant churches, so they didn't know about that old Catholic stuff that I don't want people to know. Now, you were a member of St. Mary's. Yes, I was. At at that time. Tell me a little bit about TQ. Well, I I think, and I'm really glad you picked those clips. Those are good clips to pick. Um, He talks about the dividing line. Uh, St. Mary's was the second time he'd been in Norfolk. He'd originally... In the early 60s, he'd been at Sacred Heart over in Ghent. And uh, one of the things that kind of speaks to, both those clips kind of speak to, is the fact that TQ had kind of a hyper-awareness of racially. And I think that was really what kind of, you know, made him closer to the congregation at St. Mary's in as much. He had a sensitivity to racism and to just racial issues. And so, yeah, when he went to Sacred Heart, he could see where the dividing line in Norfolk was. And when he got to Norfolk, um, he kind of used kind of, I would say, psychological judo because, you know, we'd had white priests the whole time, and and he was white. And so you have that kind of patriarchal kind of relationship where not only are you going to do what the priest says because he's a priest, but he's a white person. But he kind of used that against him in much as how he encouraged them to inc- to use their culture in their faith that he actually you know caused them to be more radical in terms of how they celebrate and how they worship and you know he always talked about how free they were with their spirit he, he encouraged that so that was that was a good thing and just watching him in action i mean long before there was a howard stern he was the master of all media <laughs> i mean he knew how to really get attention, how to get people's attention, how to garner media attention. And he used that always. In fact, that was actually probably part of his down uh, his downfall in terms of people focus so much on the publicity they got that they really didn't look beneath that to see that everything that he was doing had deep biblical foundations. Now talk a little bit about the uh, the whiz and okay. the ease on down the road and tell people a little bit about that, that scenario at the church okay. at the time. Okay, well for the whiz, um, mainly at the time, 
Um, the Wizard come out, and so TQ kind of looked at that. He, he basically in the film he kind of talks about how, you know, people were saying, "Had had you seen the Wiz?" and he didn't know what they were talking about, and people had been going to New York to see the Wiz, and he just, you know, he knew it was an adaptation of the Wizard of Oz, and he kind of looked in terms of that how that would fit into the Linton theme. And, you know, so Lent is a journey, easing on down the road, you know, the yellow brick road. And so he took that and he, everything he did, he just didn't come off with it out of his head. He worked with the liturgy committee at St. Mary's and that's, that still exists today. And they were partners in terms of developing a Lenten liturgy that would incorporate the whiz, but tie that into the gospel. And so he actually had you know, where he had ease on down the road, the lyrics from that. But then he also, the biblical phrases were talking about, you know, take only this, take a robe and all of these things, and that's all you would take. And he had the church, he had somebody install yellow bricks in the church. And he basically, every week he had a different program, but it all related to the gospel of that year and to the Lenten theme, taking you all the way to Easter. Okay, I remember uh, the the Nat Turner um, were you th- were you there at the, the, the time when the church did the Nat Turner? I wasn't um, there. I was I was away at school, but yeah, we heard about that. Familiarize our our listeners with that whole scenario for those who don't. I think know Nat what Turner happened. Nat Turner represented a real turning point in how TQ was approaching adaptation to liturgy, and previously he'd used comic book figures like Superman, and then he used Broadway plays, The Wiz. But now he turned to a point where he wanted to actually make the gospel more real by tying in African-American history. And so while, so he basically read the diary of Nat Turner and he took the liturgy committee down to Cortland to the library there to do some research. And they, he decided that he wanted to do the Easter liturgy based on Nat Turner. And basically, you know, they would, they built a cabin in the church and then they would do readings from Nat Turner and then they would do readings from the gospel. But it boiled down to focusing on some of the biblical principles in terms of a Catholic principle where following your subjective conscience, which Nat Turner did, even if it's erroneous, if you follow that, you know, that's a Catholic principle. But it boiled down to being condemned to death and you know, Jesus was condemned to death, and Nat Turner was condemned. So, what was going through their mind? What did they feel? How you know? How did they accept that? And uh, so, that's what they did. And they even went down to Cortland and actually did the condemnation ceremony on the steps of the courthouse where Nat Turner was condemned. And they had a, they had a little bit of controversy when they did that, didn't they? But they had some controversy, <laughs> I think, inside and you know, internal to St. Mary's because not all not all people kind of agreed with that. But but again. He took the time to explain to the congregation, but when you have outsiders looking in on that that aren't part of a congregation, aren't part of the parish's communication coming from TQ, specifically saying this is how this relates to Nat Turner, not advocating what Nat Turner did, but looking in terms of Nat Turner's faith, you know, and turning that and you know adapting that and making that relevant to people in terms of the liturgy. All right, I want to listen to um, another clip and um, where TQ explains a a little bit of something here. My big challenge I gave to myself was, and of course they weren't all great, but it was an attempt to how do you make it real for 21st and 20th century people? A document came out from the Vatican that uh, each culture should uh, use the principle of adaptation. Well, a lot of people didn't agree with the way he adapted, but... <laughs> well, they they might not agree with the way he adapted, but again, he had, you know, biblical foundations and the Second Vatican Council. That's a good clip because that kind of ties into the fact that TQ, when he was in seminary, people look at Vatican II as something that just started on a particular date, but Vatican II went from the late 50s to the mid 60s. And all of the topics that they were discussing during the Second Vatican Council weren't things that just kind of popped up. Those are things that were kind of discussed in the seminaries prior to becoming Vatican II. And so TQ was in seminary during that time when they were discussing all things. And the way it played out is when they actually started to implement Vatican II, 
all of the young priests that had been in seminary prior to Vatican II and during Vatican II, once they got out into the parishes, I mean, the pastor's job is to run the church. So to implement some of these things, especially moving away from the Latin mass, things like that, you know, they can't do that and run the parish. So they kind of relegated that to the younger priests. And TQ took that ball and ran it and talks about, you know, taking in cultural considerations when you're preaching the gospel makes it more real for people. And that's what he believed. And that's what he did at every, every parish he went. He definitely implemented that. Tom, tell our listeners a little bit about the Norfolk Mafia. I thought that was interesting, that, that nickname. <laughs> well, the Norf- for- Norfolk Mafia is kind of a nickname that they gave to some, some of his peers. And uh, mainly, he was kind of the lightning rod. You know, he, he would take all the heat, but they were his support group. And even though Bishop Sullivan would say in the movie that he wasn't part of the Norfolk Mafia, you see several clips where he's with all of those, he's with them all the time. And he was kind of their secret backer, and he was a bishop. So a lot of the things that they were able to do, you know, he was able to protect TQ, but also, you know, he kind of took advice from the Norfolk Mafia. But they were kind of a group where, you know, TQ would have an idea, or they would all have ideas about how do you implement the reforms of Vatican II in their parishes and so TQ would do it and of course there'd be some backlash against that but once he'd done it you know that kind of opened the doors for them to do it in their parishes and they always gave some support and behind the scene always worked behind the scenes you know number one to support him but also to if people had questions people come to him to claim about TQ to explain well this is what's going on yeah, I, I thought it was kind of funny. I was as I was listening to um, the documentary, watching it, and um, they were talking about. It, and I, I know pastors that do this today. When people come in late, they said he would, you know, he would oh, point yes. them out, or if uh, people w- tried to leave early, he's like, "Why'd you bother to come?" Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I would imagine that would that would have had, you know, uh, an impact on some people. I'm never coming back, and then other people, the people that especially that were in the documentary, loved him. They did. They, they loved him. Some of them talked about how he had impacted their lives and changed the way they, they looked at, at different things. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And, and, and that was something that over the course of making the film, you just see just a trail of changed lives of people who, and I, I think if you look in terms of not only the changed lives, but the things, the ministries that those people took on to do. I mean, there was one couple that were at a, at his parish in Northern Virginia. And um, in Northern Virginia, he had actually integrated that parish because he kept said every Sunday, I see this black family just kind of walk past our parish to go to another church. And so he integrated that parish and they went on, you know, this couple went and just continued that in Northern Virginia. Uh, you look in terms of St. Mary's. I mean, when he got there, he always talked about the conditions he found there, people not being able to have good grocery stores. Well, today, St. Mary's has a soup kitchen, and now they have like a, a farmer's market that they do. So that's kind of a continuation of his legacy. Pocosin, they have the thrift store. That continues to the point that now in Pocosin, when social services runs out of money to give people gas cards or things like that, they step right in, and they, they fill in the gap for social services. Okay, now he finished his time at St. Mary's in the late 90s? I think it was like, uh, he was there 11 years. So I was thinking it was like 85, 86. Okay. All righty. And now I want to hear um, this last clip from him about... Um, uh, about, about how to end it. About, <laughs> right. about his replacement, about leaving. We got a lot of publicity at St. Mary's because it, it was uh, the only black Catholic church in town or in the biggest one in the diocese. And you had creative people on the liturgy committee. And once you gave them an idea, you know, in white suburbia, you had to push them. But in the black parish, they ran with it. All righty, well. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, they did. They did quite a bit there. Um, Even after, they asked him to step down. I mean, they, they, I guess the word would be forced retirement, maybe? It was a forced retirement. Um, Mainly the citation was that he had reached the mandatory age, but... Um, the story is that it actually never been really enforced. And that was kind of one of the first times it had been enforced. And so that actually, and it, I mean, it was a, a series of events that occurred. Number one, uh, when Bishop Sullivan retired, uh, Bishop Sullivan had basically, I mean, Bishop Sullivan was the one that brought him down from what was, what, you know, the Diocese of Richmond used to retire 
used to encompass all of all of uh, Virginia. And then as Vatican II played out, they had more conservative clergy in Northern Virginia that wanted that didn't want to have that implementation implementation. So they had their own diocese, the Dar- diocese of Arlington. And so Tiki was still in the diocese of Arlington and he knew he wouldn't get made to survive there. So Bishop Sullivan brought him down into the Tidewater area. When you look at that, so, and throughout his career, Bishop Sullivan, one of kind of the shadow members of the Norfolk Mafia, basically protected him. When he retired, um, that protection was no longer there. And so they forced him to retire. But I think the new bishop, Bishop DiLorenzo, uh, he didn't. He had some unintended consequences when he uh, forced <laughs> him to retire, yeah. because in forcing him to retire, that meant he didn't have a home parish, so he could be kind of a guest priest at different places. He could hold these classes, and so he actually got out. You know, he was able to talk to more people and expose more people to this kind of unorthodox approach to liturgy, and that that caused even more problems. Yeah, I noticed he was uh, he was quite busy after his retirement. Exactly. As far as um, that was concerned. And then they said, no, can't well, do it anymore. Right. I mean, it was, um, I mean, you have the system. I mean, if you look in the book, um, you can't imprison the word of the Lord. You know, there's nothing, I mean, and which is a lot of the research for the film came from is basically the letters of complaint about TQ. But you can see towards the end, I mean, yeah, when somebody writes a letter to the bishop, the bishop has to, you know, investigate. And so when Bishop Sullivan was the bishop, I mean, he would basically, you know, they would have a discussion, but he would boil down to, he would he would err on the side of TQ, not err on the side of TU, but, you know, TQ would explain what he was doing. And if they were, you know, simpatico on that, it would be okay. With Bishop DiLorenzo, he wasn't as tolerant. And so the one... Christmas Eve service that he had um, kind of pushed things over edge. Okay. I think, I don't know, do we have time to share what he said during that Christmas Eve service? Um, I think it boiled down to uh, someone complained about the fact that he was talking about body, you know, anatomy, certain anatomical terms he was talking about. And the person, the crux of the letter was, I came to have a good service and here's this guy talking about vaginas and things like that. And so, so that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Got it. <laughs> okay. Calvin, what is it um, that you hope when people watch this film or, or see the art exhibit that they will, will take from it? Well, I mean, I'm glad you brought up the, the art exhibit. I think the art exhibit is kind of a, an extension of the film. I, when I people look at the film, I want the film to kind of be the gateway, the door, to be able to come into the world of TQ and to be more, do what TQ wanted and be more responsible for their faith. But the film is just a gateway. You've got the film. There are three books now. There's the book that uh, Kathleen McBlair edited, which is just a book of his homilies. There's a book, You Cannot Imprison the Word of the Lord, which is a collection of all the letters of complaint that we kind of use extensively in the movie. And then there's the book, The Trouble with TQ, which is basically the transcript of the film. And so all three of those kind of work as kind of a hub you know, a resource hub, and then the art exhibit, which is going to start September, uh, August 8th and run through September 14th at the 111 Gallery. And um, so that's going to be a resource. I mean, the, the paintings are kind of a visual resource. When we were making the film, you know, you, you have to use visuals. And so we're kind of sh- not short on visuals, but so we had archival photographs that we uh, licensed from the Virginia Pilot, and then I had artists do paintings based on that. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry we're out of time, but thank you so much. For Thanks sharing. for having me. We hope um, the information that was shared today will be helpful. If you'd like to hear more of our show, please log on to our website at anotherviewradio.org. Barbara will be back next week when we'll discuss um, children getting them ready for back to school. I want to thank Morgan Chase, who filled in for me. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Alicia Washington answered our phones. Have a wonderful weekend. And as always, we look forward to getting together again next week for another view.